Hello, it is now time for 1907. Ooh. 1907 is a very good year. For example, in 1907, I would be positively, spectacularly pretty. That's important. <laughs> Judging by the beards one on time. Anyway, leaving that to one side, 1907. What happens in 1907? Well, I could start off by starting with this. This will be the end slide we'll get to, but in 1907, as you can see, another nation has entered the race. America has increased its procurement. There is Brazil in there. Suddenly, there are a whole load of dreadnoughts being built. However, if you consider the ones for Brazil are being built in Britain, and that Britain has roughly seven in production by the end of this year. And two more for Brazil. That's nine in total. Germany has four in production, and America has four in production. So there are nine dreadnoughts being built in the UK, and there's already one in service, to the combined total of eight being built anywhere else in the world. And this is the beginning of an arms race, apparently. Britain already has one in service. And if you notice, that pre-dreadnought number, well, it's not gone down much. In fact, it's not gone down at all. Many of the really interesting battleships gone down. Yes, many of these ships are in reserve. Which is another concept which modern nations do not seem to have much of an understanding of the uh, concept of a reserve. But for those probably government ministers who may stumble across this video, a reserve means ships you can add that are actually considered viable to perform at least secondary functions in wartime and are therefore kept in a state of good repair with possibly a core of crew, or a kernel of crew, a small number, and probably less than 10% of the overall crew, making sure that they are, everything's kept working and fine, and the rest of the crew provided from reserves, i.e. people who in peacetime do not wear uniforms, do not call each other sir or salute, or ma'am, or whatever. And they don't do that in peacetime. In peacetime, they just are normal people who occasionally turn up for training and get to shout and people and, you know, run around in uniform and look spiffing and do a lot of hard work, because let's be honest, reservists do a lot of hard work. Um, they usually, uh, there's some, uh, there used to be some expression that they were twice the citizen, because they were a regular citizen and a reservist in wartime, a uh, reservist to someone who went and fought in wartime, but to be honest, everyone in a nation which can implement national service, which pretty much every nation can with a, pass a passing a law, um, is twice a citizen under those circumstances. But the good thing about being a reservist is you're trained, theoretically, and therefore have more of a say in what you actually end up doing in wartime versus national service conscription where you tend to get drafted where you're needed so 1907 what's going on in 1907 well there is the saint vincent class and there is a quite a nice reason up there why they are listed as dreadnought bellofron temeraire superb Collingwood, St. Vincent, and Vanguard. That is most of the ships, which some of them will not actually not be in, uh, will not be actually put into construction until next year, but, well, 2000 uh, until 1908. But it's pretty much again, it's batch-free dreadnoughts. This is half the reason why the Royal Navy is able to shift into gear and start producing these ships as quickly as it is because it's just basically going boom dreadnought boom 
batch two dreadnoughts. Boom, batch three dreadnoughts. And yes, it's working on better designs, it's working on newer designs, but it doesn't need to. This is the British version of the standard uh, standard battleship. Before the Americans even discussed, uh, the, generated the standard battleship, the British. This is what the British are doing. They've got a okay design. Yes, we're probably going to want bigger guns later on. Really are, but it works. And yes, this is slightly heavier than Dreadnought, slightly bigger. Same power plant, broadly speaking. But it generates more power. That's good. We've managed to upgrade it a bit. Uh, but broadly speaking, the characteristics and everything is the same. In simple terms, Britain has built a battle squadron. And that works. That is what you need. You've, you, they have churned out seven of these. And they've got three battle cruisers building up. So they've got a battle line and they've got commerce raiders. And what's everyone else getting? They're just getting into this. And please do note, Germany and America have the same number. But America has two a year ahead of Germany. So yes, Germany's announced, jumped in and gone, we're building four We're building against Britain. America's already building four. Brazil's building two. The difference is the connotations. Why does this lead to an arms race? Because Germany does keep setting Britain as its benchmark. There is a duality of British thought in that Whilst Britain is allowed to set its benchmark as being the next two largest naval powers combined, you aren't allowed to set your benchmark against Britain. Especially not if you're a continental power who's not viewed as being dependent upon the very uh, the freedom of trade, the freedom of movement of goods, supplies, people over the oceans throughout your uh, your vast empire and holdings for your very survival and for your very position because britain doesn't have a mahusiv army well it does it has the indian army but you know so this is what's probably uh, causing the problem here America building battleship, uh, building dreadnoughts. Well, we'll get into those. Really, until I think it's North Dakota, we're not really worried too much. North Dakota is different. She's special. North Dakota is one of the unsung heroes of the American battleship force, and I'll be singing her praises very shortly. However. It is not just about what ships you're building, it's how you're building them and why you say you're building them. The Americans are building ships because they needed to protect their trade and they're saying that. The Brazilians are building ships and they're building them in British shipyards because they need to protect their trade and they're saying that. The Germans are building them, and they are saying they are building them for aggressive purposes. When we consider modern nations today, perhaps it'd be more on it would be better to actually listen to why those nations say they're building their ships, because they might not be lying when they do. We cast a lot of aspersions as to why they're building them. Sometimes their press releases are actually honest. And you shouldn't just write them off and go, but that's propaganda. That's not really why they're building them. They wouldn't really think that was viable. When someone gives you a window into their soul, look for it.
Don't pretend it's not there. Anyway. So, that's a St. Vincent class, or Batch Free Dreadnoughts. Here is the German response. Oh, that doesn't look powerful. Or does it? Because they're, go they're able to sit there and go, well, they're all, on the all the guns are on the same level, which is great for aiming them and directing them, so that's good. Builds up the ship. But top speed is 19 knots, free screw propellers, and they've gone to all the weight of having six turrets, and yet their broadside is 8 11 inches versus 8 12 inch. And yes, I know, we can get into all the baits of whether or not the 11 inch is as good as the 12 inch and the various arguments that can be put forward. But they've gone to all the weight of putting in an extra turret. This is the third batch of British Dreadnoughts. They are familiar with the design. You have to imagine they've seen it design going on. And this is what they have responded with it. A little over a thousand crew in total. And let's be honest, they are very reminiscent of a pre dreadnought in their weapons fit. Because, yes, they have 12 11 inch guns in the six double turrets in a very much a pre-dreadnought layout. They have 12 15 centimeter guns in single mounts, and they have 16 88 millimeters guns in single mounts. In simple terms, they are far closer to the Cunaberti ideal than they are to the Dreadnought. Yet they are Dreadnoughts. That's how we describe them. They have triple expansion steam engines, not turbines, but they're Dreadnoughts. I would say, myself, That the Nassau class are actually the closest ships built to the Kinaberti ideal. But I would say they also show the fact that this break between Dreadnought and pre Dreadnought that we like to talk about is both far greyer, far more of an evolution than we na naturally presume in terms of its action, in terms of what happens from the descriptions. Mm, but I would also argue that some of the ships which we maybe classify as dreadnoughts, and I'm not going to get into the battle of whether or not they should be classified as a dreadnought or not, could arguably not be cla uh, classified as not dreadnoughts, as intermediate dreadnoughts, or intermediate battleships. Which is a whole different thing, and there are I have seen various comments going around about intermediate ships. But if you make the Nasu and a Nassau class an intermediate ship, which I would say makes sense because whilst they have the guns, they don't have the steam, they don't have the turbines. And I've talked about this before in terms of Austrian and Hungarian ships. Then it makes it even more of a thing when you're looking at this. It makes it even more of a, well, the British ones are all full dreadnoughts. They're all turbines. If we add in intermediates into this, the, the, this graph, it makes it look even more a case of where is this race coming from? Where is this idea? Where is this fear coming from? 
why did a uh, why and also why are the germans pushing it so much and you start to realize that a lot of it is down to the realities of your geostrategic position in the case of britain yes it looks massive it's got a sun never set to the british empire and all these lovely things that they can claim and spout about and that make them seem really strong but there's also the fact that they're dependent upon maritime trade and their literal hub of that empire is a not very small but not as big as australia let's be honest island off the north west coast of europe full of industry but that's the hub of the global empire and the trouble is where is germany if germany was japan building it well britain probably be less worried they're the other side of the world from them they've got a lot of strategic depth to swallow up their whatever strength they have to throw at them america building just as strongly on the face of it as germany and yet yeah we have some antagonism going back and forth but we're not really as worried about them as we are germany it's proximity and it's what germany's talking about what they're doing so that's the nassau's eventually i'll get the right button They have good armor, but again, if we think about it, the St. Vincent's 10-inch armor, same belt, turrets, 28 centimeters, um, turrets, 11 inches. The, there is not much difference when you're talking about the quality of armor, the, the quality of the ship's uh, hull shape and all these things the difference is that's a fairly clean and focused design which is focused around i would say a north sea engagement and especially from its it's going to sound strange it's 21 knot speed and its range of 6900 nautical miles yeah that can get around the world but this is not the big globe tropping battleship this is a battleship the british have got for the north sea and possibly the north atlantic and this one well it theoretically has a range of 8300 nautical miles at 12 knots so it can go two knots faster in its cruising speed. So it's got. Let's say if it reaches its maximum top speed. Rather than its design top speed of 20 knots. It has a one knot disadvantage in top speed. From all the British battle line. Which might be enough to land across the T. But might not be. But it does have a longer cruising range. Think about what Britain's scared of. And remember, British naval intelligence is fairly good at this point. Then you have the Delaware class. Well, these are the big, big dogs. Uh, full load, 22,759 tons. Displace normal displacement, 20,707 tons. I have to say Delaware, which is pictured here, lovely. Two sets of vertical triple expansion engines, just like the Germans and the Sony others. Top speed, of, theoretically, both had a top speed of 21 knots and a range of 6,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. So again, nothing that's really going to worry about the British too much. But North Dakota, two Curtis steam turbine sets. And oh yes, a broadside of 10 12-inch guns. And look at the way they're lined out. And 
They've got super firing ones. So that means, although I'm not sure about firing whatever we'll call um, X turret, let's say, because let's sort of say X, Y, Z. Over the top of Y turret, but it should be fine. After all, B turret fires over A. But you've got the super firing guns, so you've got four for, uh, can uh, fire anything forward, four and fire uh, anything aft. But again, you don't have to turn that ship around that much to have ten guns able to focus on any of your threats. I would argue strongly that the first time you're seeing an improvement coming through and a capability which the British have to match technologically, it's the North Dakota, not Delaware. I'm... She has the 10 guns and she looks very pretty, but... Her triple expansion engines, yes, she can get up to that speed of 20 knots, she can't maintain it for any long time. North Dakota can, and North Dakota has heavy firepower. So I would say, technologically, it's the Americans in 1907 who are starting to catch up or, and in some places, surpass the British. The British have surpassed the Americans in some areas, and you have to expect this. The idea that one side is going to be universally more advanced than the other is, again, something which only turns up in the 1990s and 2000s. Uh, the reality is you bank on your opponent being roughly um, the same technological level as you, and you'll be okay. The odds are, in some areas, they're going to be better. In some areas, they're going to be not as good, because that's the reality of technological development. In the case of the Delaware class, well, in the case of the Delaware, she's good. Oh, fantastic. In the case of North Dakota, whoa, she's a good ship. But another nation has entered the dreadnought race. Yes. They are beautiful. They're Brazil, of course. And Brazil's entering it because, well, they've been having a bit of a run time. Chile and Argentina have been building up ships. And Brazil's been going between sort of economic issues, internal issues. They're now out of that, and they can now start stretching themselves. So, yeah. It's time to build. Now, again, you have the lovely offset wing turrets. But, it's sensible. They're not designed to fire over across the ship's hull, so that's fine. And they do have super firing again this is built in the uk but britain gets to build them super firing and go and test out its technology on this while still building let's go back what britain's building at this point what they're building for someone else so they're testing out the technologies power is provided by 18 babcock and wilcox boilers that seems rather standard uh, displacements, mm, roughly 19,300 19, tons. Armaments, 12, 12 inch guns. Yeah, she's a lovely ship, but here, this is this. Range of 10,000 nautical miles at 10 knots. And a top speed of 21 knots. So this is what Britain can build. And again, this is sensible. But if you are the Americans and you're going, I'm building the Delawares, well, your broadside's 10 guns. Her broadside is 10 guns. Without using all our turrets. 
And, okay, we're talking about a six turret ship, but let's go back to the Nassau's. Again, honestly, if you're firing forward or aft, do you really want to fire the inner guns on those turrets? On the wing turrets? Probably not if you want your ship to be okay. You might do it. As I said, you just said before, you might do it if you have to, but you don't expect to do it without damaging your ship. Well, the superstructure. Again, though, that design is interesting because it's got an eight gun broadside for 12 turrets. Uh, for six turrets. This for five turrets has got a 10 gun broadside, and this for six turrets has got a 10 gun broadside. Again, bring up this little picture. You've got to admit that the Menes Grace is certainly far more along the lines of a Dreadnought than a Kinnaberti, as the original expressed. Um, as Kinnaberti's now, current at this point, is talking about, no. But, interesting though, a note, let's uh, after all that discussion, there are two sets of Vickers triple expansion engines, not turbines. So again, why go with the triple expansion engines? Because they're reliable and you can refit them. And it's another reason why the Americans are sticking with them and one of the reasons why the Germans are sticking, have been sticking with them. Because you know you have lots of places which can maintain and refit triple expansion engines. They are the common technology at this point. And also, the good thing about a mature common technology is you know pretty much what to expect when you get it. A turbine is still something new. So why are the British shoveling into it? Well, thanks in part to Turbina, but also thanks in part to the work they have been doing with turbines, are starting to bear fruit. So the British are getting a very efficient engine. And this is, how do I put this, this is going to grow as the ships go on, as the generations come through. So let's consider what's going on in the world. Raw Navy, looking very nice and spiffing. Seven ships, uh, seven dreadnoughts in uh, in production. A uh, one dreadnought in service. And that thirty nine pre dreadnoughts. <sighs> Let's consider everyone else. Well, Germany and America both have surfeit number of pre dreadnoughts, and still have America still has plenty of pre dreadnoughts under construction. Germany has as many, as many pre-dreadnoughts under construction as it has dreadnoughts under construction at this point. France and Italy still not into the dreadnought race, despite the Cunaberti ideas. And you have Brazil on the way down there. So what have we got coming up? We have, this week ahead of us, we have monitors of Royal Navy Section uh, 3. So that's going to be um, the third better class of monitors. And we have got the suggestion from Discord, which was AdFab's Coastal Command in the 1920s and 1930s. Now, thank you everyone for watching. If you liked, please do like. If you fancy watching more, please subscribe down there. Um, if you feel like being really alerted when it's live and watching me live and chatting away and asking questions, there's a bell down there, which I'm told if you press it, most of the time works quite well. Thank you to everyone who's on Discord and who chats away, and thank you to everyone who's on Patreon. It really does mean a lot, and the vote will still for the selecting the choices of May will still be a lot uh, still be live when this video goes live but we have votes every uh, we have a suggestion system every month and from those suggestions i pick six to eight ideas 
put them into the voting uh, boxes and then the patrons get to vote. So the patrons get to suggest the topics and then the patrons get to vote on the topics. And the top two are the two I do. So, you know, hope you enjoy. Thank you very much. And hope you enjoyed, uh, hope you enjoyed uh, 1907.